was a show unlike any other Newcastle has ever staged. Right from the outset, Newcastle's school children were given a particularly high profile. From the march down Hunter Street by Year 7 students donning circus gear to the opening extravaganza, the children excelled beyond all expectations. Hunter students also created a world record, the largest band ever, made up of 1,788 students from the region. According to show president Glenn Varley, the educational excursions kept pavilion organisers on their toes. And then the school excursions, of course, on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday was a tremendous success because not only did the kids come along and, and enjoy themselves and have a bit of fun education, but more importantly, I think it put us on our metal and uh, made us uh, perform, I suppose, as far as that area is concerned. And there was a tremendous improvement all around. Uh, the educational information that was available in all the uh, particular committee areas, cattle, birds, dogs, you name it. Like previous bicentennial events in the city, the show culminated in a spectacular fireworks display. But today the glamour had faded and the inevitable clean-up began. The Ferris wheel that had spent the past four days packed with people looked somewhat dejected as crews began disassembling it. The sparkle of Sideshow Alley had ground to an abrupt halt. Organisers are thrilled with the result and say it will be hard to improve on in future years. Taken a pretty steep uh, move up the ladder, I think, with this particular one, and I don't really expect that we can continue at that same rate of improvement. But there is no reason why we can't improve on what we've already done. And the enthusiasm that's around now to go and do more, and, to, and all, the, all the comments I've heard back from all the various areas is yes, we can do better next year. So I, I expect that we will do better, but we won't, perhaps not at the same rate of improvement. About 20,000 people packed into the International Sports Centre for the annual Challenge Cup. As Newcastle prepares for its first game in the Sydney League next week, all eyes are on the Knights to see how they perform. Much of the Sydney press had already written Newcastle off this year, claiming they were likely to be at the bottom of the ladder. But right from the outset, the Knights proved that they are not a team to be taken flippantly. Robert Chew put the first points on the board with a penalty in the first minute. Five minutes later, Owen Cunningham scores an easy try for the Sea Eagles through some weak defence from the Knights. O'Connor converts and Manley race to a 6-2 lead. In the 15th minute, Robert Chew adds another two points, Manley lead 6-4. Chew's in the action again just five minutes later, he grubber kicks on the fifth tackle and Tony Townsend wins the race to the ball. Chew converts and the Knights now lead 10-6. At that stage, the Knights were playing like they'd been in the Sydney competition for years, matching it with Manly in every department. The Knights were in again only 15 minutes from the break through fullback Glenn Frendo. Chew again converts, and Newcastle had run away with the game leading 16 6. The Knights then put the first half beyond doubt as Glenn Miller was through to score Newcastle's third try. Chew then kicks his fifth goal from his many attempts, and the locals go to the break leading 22 to 6. In the second half, not many points were scored. Second rower Noel Peel set up halfback Paul Shaw for the only try of the second half. Throughout the rest of the game, the Knights kept up their strong defence and although Manley made a few good breaks, they were unable to capitalise on them. When the full-time siren went and it sank in that Newcastle Knights had won 24 to 12, they were able to bask for a while in the sweet taste of victory. Coach Alan McMahon was clearly thrilled with the results and believes it will give players faith in their ability. They have to believe in themselves and I'm sure after today that the crowd and themselves, they believe that they can perform in this winter a couple of days. Well, what I think it'll do to them, Jane, is that it'll give them faith in their ability. Um, you know, there's no greater um, 
negative thinking and, and cross-examination because you're the worst at it and you cross-examine yourself. You know, I just think that uh, out of today, they will have faith in their ability. Are you warning them too, though, that not to get overconfident? Well, we've always jolted back to reality, yeah. I mean, it doesn't take long for that. But they have to believe in themselves, and I'm sure after today that the crowd and themselves, they believe that they can perform in this one for a couple of hours. Before the match yesterday, it was obvious Sydney football would boom in Newcastle with more than 21,000 turning up at the recently revamped International Sports Centre. It was to have been a David and Goliath affair. On paper, Manly was the better team, boasting five internationals. On the other hand, Newcastle was young, keen and had nothing to lose against the Sydney Premiers. Manly scored the first try of the match through Owen Cunningham, who sliced through some poor defence. After that, the Knights tightened up their defence and played gutsy champagne football to score the next three tries. Outstanding for the Knights was hooker Tony Townsend, who found gaps in Manly's defence all day and was rewarded with the Blues' first try after a grubber kick from Robert Chu. It was now obvious the Knights were not going to be a pushover in this year's competition. Midway through the first half, Newcastle is in again through fullback Glenn Frendo. The Knights' third try was scored by centre Glenn Miller wide out who kicks the conversion to have the Seagulls down 22 to 6 at half time. Only try in the second half was scored by Paul Shaw after great lead up play by Noel Cleal. Despite the boil over, the Knights are philosophical about the win and how they will fare in the coming season. Rugby league is a game that's uh, fought with danger on uh, forecasting the future. And it's a week by week proposition by us. We look at our games and I'm sure I speak on behalf of Alan that we analyse our, our strengths and our weaknesses and we keep our strengths and try to improve the weaknesses. Tanker drivers in Newcastle responded to the call to return to work for the afternoon shift and by just before four o'clock trucks were loaded and ready to roll. Drivers had no hesitation once a check with their union confirmed the OK as they appear to have not wanted to be on strike in the first place. The first truck out of the Caltex terminal at Wickham went straight to the trucking depot nearby in Hanel Street. There the driver told me he'd been with the company 32 years and while he regretted having to move to Ben Fox he felt that company is all right and the federal body of the TWU should not have intervened. He made it clear though that he resented being ordered back to work oh, under threat of legal action. I think the law stinks, don't you? Oh, the law Say the you law. wanted to go on strike and you said because of some reason or other, and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, the police come around to you and said if you don't go to work, put you in jail. Right? You reckon that's what sort of company is it? Even though the drivers are back, it will be some days before stocks can be built up to normal, even though the Premier expects rationing to cease tomorrow afternoon. Because the report that drivers will be back on the job this afternoon led to a reduction in demand, with retail outlets saying panic buying ceased almost immediately. Earlier in the day, though, the driveways were choked with cars, eager to take up their legal option for $10 worth of petrol in an odd-numbered car. And these scenes may even be repeated again in the near future if industrial harmony cannot be established in the long term. The Mozambique Civil War continues to cripple the country, the toll in innocent victims rises. The Princess Royal is president of the Save the Children Fund. As Russian helicopters flew security patrols, she inspected some of the work being done in this war-torn region. The war is creating thousands of refugees and here Save the Children is providing seeds and tools to help re-establish village life. As always, children are hardest hit. This infant is being treated for cerebral malaria in a health centre rebuilt built after a rebel raid. Half Mozambique's children died before they turned five.
Half a world away and in pleasant contrast, the Duke and Duchess of York were doing their bit promoting British products in California. Some paid as much as $1,000 for a seat close to the Royals. Fergie's eye-catching gown attracted comment, although the Yves Saint Laurent creation apparently made walking a little difficult. Then a special there was a rare guests, public a rare address from the from Duchess, Duchess of, York. of York. Last, I have the turn to talk. <laughs> All these men around here. A man called out, man, I, I love you. I love you. I'll see you later. <laughs> Kenry's News at 10. million dollar program to counter truancy has been extended to the Hunter region. According to Regional Director of Education Alan Beard, 5% of Hunter students play truant, while their parents are legally responsible for making sure they go to school. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. In NBN News tonight at 6, an exciting breakthrough for a local butcher who's come up with a revolutionary process for meat which takes out all the fat and much of the cholesterol but leaves in the protein and the taste. It's called Naturaline and it could represent a massive export trade for Newcastle within a year. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Chapman Meats set up this research and development facility at the old Newcastle Abattoir site in the Warrabrook Estate. The natural lean process involves the deboning and mincing of meat before it's treated. Although the process is a closely guarded secret, it involves making the fat and cholesterol insoluble. The protein remains soluble. The process separates these components to the point where 96% of the fat is removed and cholesterol is reduced by 30%. It is an irrefutable fact that heart disease and arterial disease are associated with the consumption of fat from animals and from poultry and that if one could remove this that the incidence of heart disease and arterial disease would decrease. This prototype factory has been established by Chapman Meats in the former Newcastle Abattoir complex and represents an investment of ten million dollars and 15 years of study by the inventor of the process, Dallas Chapman, a fifth generation Newcastle butcher. The, the real uh, motivation behind it was that uh, my father died when he was 48 of uh, uh, heart disease. My uncle's all similar ages and I thought well then uh, it was all put down to atheosclerosis and uh, so I thought well from there on we've uh, got to do something about it as well as the fact that uh, the meat industry has been a sagging meat industry, red meat industry. Are you excited about the export prospects of this particular product? Terribly excited at the moment. We've just come back from America and uh, we have quite a lot of things in the pipeline at the moment. And uh, next week we'll be in Japan again. The process will be marketed in much the same way as NutraSweet, the sugar substitute. The company expects to sign special license arrangements with a major meat processor and chicken producer within the next two months and then start exporting by the middle of this year. Meantime, continuing research is applying the process to other food proteins, such as turkey and even fish. The process is of great interest to them, particularly since it's the only low-fat, low-cholesterol process in the world. How's it done? That's a secret, John. I can't tell you that. For the last four months, this special test kitchen has been experimenting with natural lean processed meat, and they've come up with all sorts of ways to cook it, burgers, kebabs, meatloaf, and even the humble meatball. Mmm, tastes good. And with the value of the Australian processed meat market now at $950 million a year, many of the Newcastle-based shareholders are hoping this breakthrough will start to pay some handsome dividends. There's a lot of Newcastle people who have backed me all the way through and uh, I'd like to see them get some sort of return on their money for it and I'm damn sure they will after last week, yeah.
organisers claimed the gala concert would be one of the biggest musical events Newcastle had ever experienced and a highlight of the bicentennial program for the city. Last night it was obvious that many thousands agreed. Those who started taking their places at 3 o'clock in the afternoon were vindicated by concert time when the southern end of King Edward Park was transformed into a sea of bodies. Besides Australia's premier orchestra, the Sydney Symphony, the evening's program featured a number of names which would have individually filled a concert hall, including arguably Australia's best concert pianist, Roger Woodward. The evening's music varied from opera to Australian ballads, and many made the most of the outdoor setting and perfect weather to relax with a deck chair and a glass of wine. High on everyone's list of favourites, of course, is the William Tell Overture, and last night it was not forgotten. still to come. No doubt Australians will see more fireworks this year than ever before. Last night they exploded into showers over the park in a dramatic finale that left the crowd breathless. I'm Jim Sullivan. This morning, in a daring robbery carried out in front of railway staff, armed robbers have attacked two security guards at the Broadmeadow Loco Yards and have snatched a suitcase containing a large amount of money, part of the payroll for the yard. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. The Real Estate Institute says neither the government or the opposition has recognised the housing crisis which extends to Newcastle. Institute President Robert Bevan says Newcastle's rental vacancy rates are less than 1% and says there have been few new buildings for rental accommodation in the past decade because of the massive disincentive provided by land tax and stamp duty. The Institute wants stamp duty abolished for first home buyers and says land tax should be put on a sliding scale. Research carried out by the Institute shows land tax revenue has risen an average 12.4% every year, information that's been hidden in finance department figures. Real Estate Institute has been conducting a non-party political election campaign uh, for the last uh, 18 months. Many people will remember uh, our uh, stand on negative gearing but it's uh, obviously because there's an election on where 
asking both uh, parties to come forward with their housing policies. Peter Wright is from Tasmania where he ran a wildlife park in Koala Village. But he wanted to move to New South Wales and had his sights set on a smaller tourist venture. An overland draft horse trick a few years ago gave him the inspiration for setting up his own business in the Pocolban area. He says gypsy caravan tours are operating successfully in Victoria and he's confident that his new venture will take off. The idea is that you hire a draft horse and caravan for three days or more and spend your time leisurely plodding around the region. Each night you stop at pre-arranged campsites. We check the people morning and evening and we have to do a massive amount of training with the horses. So all the person's really got to be able to do is say, or whoa, like that, or like that, horse is off. Peter has two of the caravans and draft horses operating initially and plans to have a total of ten operating by Christmas. In tonight's news, the Dungog timber industry is set to receive a boost if a planned four and a half million dollar expansion for local timber millers Boral goes ahead. The company says the decision is now in the hands of the state government, as it will only proceed with the development if it is guaranteed sufficient logging into the future. For all the news, join us tonight at, at six. six. Tonight we'll bring you a report on the latest developments with the Newcastle Conservatorium's new $4.7 million performance hall. The hall is due for completion in May. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. For all those who've ever dreamed of inheriting a fortune, it can happen. An astonished Englishman has just been bequeathed an entire country village by a distant relative. Suffolk, population 300, is worth more than $30 million. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. thing about it, we're all going to throw in $100 or something and um, give him some money about it, so it's going to really make up for his bad thing. Have you spoken to him since the win? No, no, I haven't seen him. I suppose, um, I say he might know about it now. 